Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. In this episode, Paul and Jerry are talking about working versus living. You choose. Jerry, just to kind of lay the foundation, why don't you tell us a little bit about your life and and kind of what shaped you and what uh, led to you becoming a student of the Czech Academy, because that's quite a radical shift from being in, in the corporate world. About the age of six or seven, I suppose, I had my first existential crisis, <laughs> faced my dark <laughs> night of the soul. Um, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was I was sitting down. I was an only child. Uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mom, so it was me and mom all day, every day. And we're sitting on my bed, and we're watching a Disney movie, and she looks at me, and she says, honey, I'm moving to California. So I say to her, uh, why are we moving to California? Where were you at? at we time? were in Orofino, Idaho. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I'll never forget when she looked at me and said, no, honey, I am moving. Oh, but does that mean that you stayed with your father? I did. I stayed with my father. You can, you can be abandoned by your parents. You can, the people you put the most faith and trust in, the most love, in, in, in dealing with their own issues could put you to the wayside. Yeah. And at a young age, I was obviously faced with that reality. And I was divorced by my mother <laughs> and... And so I developed a lot of compensations, coping mechanisms. Uh, I got into drugs and alcohol. I, I um, became obese at a very young age. I developed a lot of adult diseases, autoimmune conditions, um, depression, anxiety, serious anger issues. And that led to a life that you can imagine, a lot of trouble, a lot of disharmony. Uh, yeah. And so this led me to choosing a career that wasn't holistic, it wasn't all-encompassing, it wasn't legacy and purpose-based. And specifically, it was retail management. Was it simply oriented on how do I make money? Correct. Correct. Yeah. A total survival mode, right? Yeah. Like, how do I provide for myself? How do I provide for my wife? How old were you at that point? I became a store manager at 28. 28. Okay. 28. Um, and I realized it, or I didn't really realize at that point, when you make a decision about where you're going to spend your career... You're really spending that much time doing it. And you can't just wash the negative effects away by <clears throat> having a few beers after work or going and playing golf. This is really your life. You're really investing 40, 50, 60 hours a week doing this stuff. Yeah, there's not much time left in, after that. No, In no. a week, you know? Yeah, and it, we talk about there isn't time to take care of yourself after all that. Well, even if there was, what are you taking care of? What is the self that you have created? Mm -hmm. So I was in the middle of uh, dissociating from my, from my environment, which was the my corporate job right mm -hmm. i would save up all my paperwork for friday because i didn't want to, I, I wanted that sequestered time where i could sit down for a couple hours and i would listen to a podcast and this was one of those days i was checking out i was like i got three hours left i got two hours of paperwork i'll walk around the store then i'm done mm -hmm. that's like really like how how happy i was not so i'm up there and i'm um doing my paperwork and I'm like, I want to, let's do a podcast. So I pulled up Barbell Shrugged with Mike Bledsoe. Oh, wow, well, yeah. But I'll never forget, it popped up and it, Paul Check, holistic lifestyle coach. I was like, what the hell is a holistic lifestyle coach? Mm. Sounds fruity. <laughs> <laughs> Fruit of the loom, baby. So I watched it and three hours, three hours later, my jaw was firmly attached to the desk. I couldn't believe it. Everything that was being talked about, everything that was being highlighted and everything that was being screamed from the rooftops was like, that is what I felt in my heart and soul is, is the answer. It's got to be more than this. It's got to be more than counting calories. It's got to be more than high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. It's got to be more than that. Health is more than what you weigh, what you look like in the mirror. And, and I just, I needed it. I needed more. So instantly I enrolled in HLC one. And from then my life has been forever changed. I, I can't put into words, I can't even quantify the experience that I've had over the last five or six years. And we could, we could say that's Paul Check. We could say that that's a Czech Institute, which, yes, that's all part of it. But really, what was it? it was well, you're the one that has to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you have to look in the mirror and you have to say, this is a dark night. This is a dark night of the soul. This is what you've created. And what are you willing to do about it? How old are you now? I'm 44. 44. So, because you're obviously in very good shape. You've made a, you, know, you aren't the guy you're talking about anymore. No, no, no. That was an intentional, intentional uh, move. And um, I would like to, I, I guess I left a kind of an important part of the story out, which this is the one that really, when I think about it, I get emotional still. Um, 
but that can happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's good that you can still feel those emotions. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I think I just learned to feel right about that time. You know? Yeah, well, that takes a while too. Yeah, it was, it was not an attractive venture for me to think about feeling things. Well, the thing is, the more you bury, the more you're afraid to actually have to confront it. Oh, yeah. You, you get to the point where it's like, okay, well, if I just poke one hole in that dam, it might explode. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like the world's biggest beach ball that you're trying to keep under the water. Yeah. Um, but I was on a fishing trip with my father. Uh, this was like 2016, 2017. And um, so this fishing trip, it was an annual steelhead fishing trip to the Grand Ron River. It's up in the Snake River Canyon area, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Washington, o Oregon border area. And this was my trip every year that I would look forward to because what I know now was this is, that was my chance to get Zen. That was my opportunity to meditate mm. and um, connect to my higher self. But I didn't see it as that at the time, obviously. And, and this particular year, I'd, I was there and I was watching my father fish. And I'll never forget it. The word suicide hit me like a ton of bricks and download. How old were you then? So this was 2017, so 37, 38, okay. right around there. Yeah, that's a kind of a time where people's challenges get to be significant enough and repetitive enough that something inside them faces the reality that whatever's making choices in me is not doing a very good job. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's leading that, right? Yeah. What's towing that boat? Yeah. Um, so that, that, that obviously that spooked me because um, at the time I didn't believe in anything supernatural or paranormal. Um, I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in non-local communication. I didn't believe in any of that. I didn't believe in, in uh, buoyances. And so instantly I go right to, oh my gosh, is my, and I, I had no thoughts of self-harm or anything like that. I wanted to harm a lot of other people. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm sure su subconsciously, you know, that might've been down the road. But so I go right to, ironically enough, this person that doesn't believe in any of this stuff, I go right to, does my father think about harming himself? Right there. And I'm going, well, what the hell? You don't believe in that shit. And so it, and it happened, this was about, a, I don't know, maybe a five minute um, session, you might call it. Were you fishing or something? Yeah, we were steelhead fishing, and I, I the subconscious was coming up, and every the stars were aligned, and I experienced well, maybe buoyance you're, or something. You were near a river, weren't you? Correct. Yes, it opens the unconscious. Yes, water always opens up your unconscious. So, if you're next, this is why uh, you know. For example, when I went through a divorce with my first wife, I just had this very significant feeling that I needed to be near the ocean. Mm. And so you'll find if you work with a lot of people that are going through a life crisis, there's something inside of them that tends to draw them to water. People that normally only take showers will often start taking baths. People that are inland want to get near water because there's a, water is a symbol of our unconscious, the flow of the unconscious. Like for example, an ocean or a river is so big you can see it, but you can never really know it. Right. Right. You right. know, the Snake River, right? right. For example, how, how much of the Snake River can you get to know? Yeah. And it's so transient. Yes. And, and it's moving. Yeah. Right? It's constantly moving and changing, right? You, this the old saying, you can never step in the same river twice. Correct. Yeah. So when you're fishing or near a body of water like that, symbolically, it's activating the correlate, which is consciousness in you. And just as we can be conscious of the fact that you're holding the fishing pole and you're waiting for a fish to bite, that would be like the ego awareness, but the body and the flow of the river is like the flow of consciousness moving through us. Right. So when we're near a body of water that's moving like the ocean or a river, it's accessing the part of us that is a river of consciousness for which we have, you know, if you start looking on the riverbed, you'll find skeletons yeah yeah cars yeah guns whatever underwear, yeah all the all the <laughs> all the history all the that, all the all the all the dead laundry right? everything nobody wants you to know about is at the bottom of the river so oh, that's there's, powerful there's the correlation between water and the psyche oh that gives me chills so right about then i remember there was these sheep bighorn sheep if you've ever been in the ground run river uh the snake river canyon area you'll know about the bighorn sheep there's crash crash it's powerful yeah and they were just across the road you know if i had to guess i would say maybe a quarter mile away you know just a few hundred yards and this might have been my half drunk mind you know making this up but 
they turned and looked at me and whether this was really what universe was giving me, God was giving me, or it was just what I knew to be true was they gave me this look. It was almost like, who are you to think you can be a witness to this event? It was like, (laughs) Oh shit! Yeah, who am I? <laughs> who am I? And then that's the question that here I am, still trying to figure out yeah. who am I. Um, so, fast forward maybe a year down the road, um, I've gotten into your teachings. I've put it in play. I'm starting to feel my consciousness rising, and I I'll never forget. I'm in the middle of this meditation, and and I was like, oh yeah, I got to ask about that about that word what was that suicide crap all about, right? And I'm expecting this, well, you have this subconscious wish to harm yourself and you didn't know it. And part of that might've been true. But what I got was you needed to kill the current version of yourself. And who was this that you were asking to? God. Oh, I was in meditation. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. And, you know, and then come to find out later, you know, and studying more of Dr. Jung's work, you know, that was one of his his coined phrases. And um, I still to this day don't know if I'd, read it and subconsciously brought it up or if it was the true message but it was true and is what i needed to hear and it just put my mind at ease and Mm -hmm. from there i've just continued to have more and more of these enlightening experiences and obviously since then i'm I'm full bore on team god like you -hmm. know you can't convince me there there isn't uh that higher power in play and what i realized was everything that i went through in my life including leading me up to this career that I was now planning on leaving, had set me up to do the work I'm doing now. You know, this is the story of the wounded healer. You, you can't really help people if you haven't been through a crisis of healing yourself because you really don't know what healing is. Absolutely. And that's Absolutely. one of the problems with the medical profession. You know, we have all these people that are in the medical profession that have never actually... A lot of them have been sick. A lot of them have been broken, but they've drugged and 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 pushed it aside and kept it at the level of the physical body, and it's, it, and it's always externalized. In the brain, oh, yeah. My my, there's something wrong with me. It's my genetics, right? So it's always shelving it, like uh, you know, you take your your problem and you put it in a drawer and you give it a label. Oh, I'm this way because my mom and dad or my grandpa was this way, and I have the fat gene or I have the cancer gene or yeah. So it, everything gets compartmentalized or drugged or both. And, you know, the diagnosis is the label, right? Yes, we love labels. So what happens is as long as you can label it and shelf it, then it's just a problem that's happening to you. It's not something that you did. It's something that's happened to you. And then if a person has enough of those, then naturally they think, oh, you know, my life's the shits and um, I got the short end of the deal and I don't know how much more of this I can take, which really opens the door to a lot of addictions yeah. to try to deal with the short end of the stick, right? The, yes. You know, it's it's always, it's it can easily put someone into the victim archetype because it's always like everything is out to get me. If you go to a doctor or a therapist that has not done the inner work of healing, then all they can do is give you a label. Correct. Correct. And, and it makes them feel better. And, I, and then, well, because that's what they've been trained yep. to do, right? So good. I, I figured you, I figured you out. So you just need to take these pills or have this surgery and that's the end of it. The problem is if you start doing what I've done, which is working with thousands of people, you see that just becomes, it's like a stairway mm-hmm. that's either going to go down to hell or up to freedom. Yeah. And every label either takes you one step down into the, in, deeper into the crisis because if you don't deal with the issue, which is the neurosis, the release of the psychic energy that's about to trigger a suicide. Right, right. If you have to figure out a way to get it out of you so you don't kill yourself. So if you just keep drugging it and labeling it, then you just keep digging a deeper and deeper hole. Correct. And you end up in the underworld. Correct. Or you say, okay, I've got to confront this thing and, and be honest with what my part in, in creating this is or how do I heal it? And then you start building steps to freedom, right? And so the point I'm making is if you haven't built steps to freedom to actually come to face your part in whatever illness you have, no matter what the doctors say, genetic or 
uh, otherwise. They're just or, words. Yeah. Then then you can't really guide people. Correct. You yeah. Can't, you can't help people heal. You can only help them um, numb their symptoms. And then we ignore our own um, higher self's message, which is this isn't working. This isn't what you need. What you need to do is connect. What you need to do is love yourself or whatever whatever that individual's or, or need it, is. It could be what you need to do is be honest and tell your partner that you're not in love with them and either go to relationship counseling and work on it or get out of the relationship or you got to tell your boss that you're not happy in your work and why you're not happy and what you need. And if that doesn't work out, then you have to say, well, what is it that I really need and how can I go create it for myself? Absolutely. What would be the environment? Who would be the people? This is why... Did you ever do my PPS lesson one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's, you know, I show you right there the 10 components of a dream. And if you don't look at those things, you'll leave a gaping hole yes. that's big enough to sink your ship. Yes. And that's where, that's where, guess what? Guess where all your, your energy investment's going to go yeah. and all your thought ruminations. It's going to go right in that black hole that you created. Yeah. And that's where all the drugs are trying to patch it up. Correct. Correct. It's trying to seal the bilge of a sinking ship. Yep, that's that's exactly where where I found myself was was doing that that nonsense and that silliness and but once you let that beach ball out of the water that you've been suppressing, we just think it's going to blow our head off and we're not going to you know it's going to be this big scary thing. Yeah, there's there's these there's these ego deaths and these identity issues that you've got to really look at. But really, it's it's the most liberating thing when it comes out. Mm -hmm. And so what I found was I fell in love with shining some light on my shadows. And, um, and unfortunately we can take a look at, at the state of, of what most people find themselves in, which is very similar to where I was at, where it's like, I'm prostituting myself for a job, a relationship, friendships, you name it. And the only reason why I continue to make this choice is because I won't look in the mirror and ask myself, what are you creating? Hi, everybody. My family and I love Organifi's green juices. You can get your green juice in two excellent flavors, crisp apple and original mint. Not only are these products made with certified organic ingredients to support your family's nutritional needs, they each have some unique benefits. Your green juice crisp apple eases stress with an effective dose of 600 milligrams of ashwagandha per serving. Helps reduce cortisol spikes that increase snacking urges and aids keeping your blood sugar balanced. Why snack on inferior foods that lack nutrition and often lead to blood sugar spikes followed by blood sugar crashes when Organifi's green juices are super healthy taste great, and are as quick to make as opening the package and adding water. Your green juice crisp apple is made from fresh apples picked right off the branch and are packed with micronutrients to support your body's needs. Green juice original mint contains ashwagandha, chlorella, and spirulina. Reset your body every morning with 11 detoxifying superfoods. You'll love the delicious taste and your body will feel strong and stable with all the micronutrients in each serving. Green Juice Original Mint promotes balanced cortisol and stress levels, perfect for weight management, and helps rid the body of harmful toxins. Personally, I'm super grateful that Organifi makes such excellent, easy-to-use drinks and foods that keep us energized, healthy, and clean inside while decreasing the urge to crave on inferior snack foods. My kids love both flavors, and I love knowing that we can all be healthy together with Organifi's excellent crisp apple and original mint green juices. These products are excellent for work, on the road, sharing with friends, and anytime you need a nutritious boost that tastes good. To get your crisp apple and original mint green juices, go to O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash check 20. That's Organifi dot com forward slash check 20. Save 20% on your purchase using the code CHECK20, all caps, on checkout. Don't worry if you forget your Living 4D discount code because you'll see it right there on the landing page. Enjoy Organifi's excellent green juices. It takes a fair bit of awareness to come to the realization that you are the architect of your own life to a large degree. The human being is, is... quite slow to mature into its own independence Mm -hmm. of all the creatures in nature we're the slowest to develop independence from our uh, parents from our you know our birth parents Uh, every other creature and i mean look 
a horse a, a horse is born and able to walk and run yeah, right yeah. and um you know we, we we've been raising chickens and we have baby chicks right now they already know what to eat they already they already have all these instincts in place it's amazing to watch them and mommy's just there to protect them until they get to be big enough to kind of do their own thing so it, it actually takes a few visits from the pain teacher before you get to the point where you just have described and a lot of people start having suicidal thoughts because of the pain of the thought of having to live that way for another two, three, four, five, or ten years can can be such a weight on a person that they don't know. It's almost suffocating. It's like, how am I going to breathe my way through more of this? Yeah, and you know, to your point, and it was like every morning was it's like, man, in five years, this is going to be my day. Are you lacking gratitude? Yeah, I was. Are you lacking awareness of your situation? Yeah, I was. All that. And once you get the gratitude, once you get the awareness, it's like can you still make this work? Does this match your skill set? Does this match why you were put here? Is this the best? Are you giving people your best by choosing this career? Hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no. Why would you stay? It's safe. It's easy. Is that an acceptable answer? Hell no. That's why most people stay in the military right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that an acceptable answer? Hell no. Okay. Again, what are you going to do about it? Well, shoot. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and in all fairness, too, and I know you'll agree with this, who's teaching people how to be aware of this stuff? Who's actually giving us any training of this is what it means when you're reaching the end of the point at which a specific career, vocation, job, or even relationship is is actually fulfilling to you? Yeah. And, and, and how do you recreate yourself how do you tap into yourself to see what your calling is now and you know most of that stuff is you have to usually end up in a, a psychologist's office and then you have to end up you gotta get lucky and get a good one you gotta be lucky to find a good one yeah. that, that actually isn't just gonna you know use behavioral psychology and tell you, oh, you just, whenever that happens. It's your just, personality, your just, persona. Just think this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, Reframe. Change this with this, you know, which is really a very, very mechanical, robotic approach to a human being. And that's why it, it, it works temporarily as long as a person's willing to play the game. But it's really kind of like um, sweeping the, the real soul issue under the carpet correct, correct and that's why psychology doesn't work very well unfortunately i mean i've read many books by psychologists that outline why psychology doesn't work very well that's why jung basically wanted to in as many reasons jung created depth psychology but jung was hip to the kind of the weaknesses in freudian psychology and adlerian approaches and all the approaches of his day and and had the depth of insight to see why these things didn't work yeah. I've got a real good friend, Dr. Bruce in, in Missoula, Montana, and, and uh, he's a psychologist. But we've talked about this at length. And, and really, it's like, if, you're, if your field is the study of the soul, why do you only talk about the brain? Mm. You know, why, why, this is why this stuff isn't working. And he's got a statement, you know, that says, says a lot of our therapy and, and our drug prescriptions are to make the therapist feel better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you know, and uh, when, every time he says that, it just knocks me over because it's, it, it's like, boy, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but the whole, um, the whole model of, of diagnose this so we can label it so that we can create a duality in you. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to attack that duality and not take a look at the whole being, the whole self that created this. Mm-hmm. And incorporated that into that big self, we're not going to look at all of it. We're just going to sequester this little symptom mm -hmm. and deal with it. And to, you know, to your point earlier, why why is this not being talked about? We are trained, in my opinion, in my life experience, we are trained. It's let's go to the Bible. This is this is the authority. This is the word, but it doesn't make sense. Like you say this, and then this happens you're not smart enough to ask that question. You're trying to figure it out on your, by yourself. And mm -hmm. then I just go, well, what self are you talking about? Mm -hmm. um, 
so it, it starts there, not even with the Bible. That can we ask a question? Not, not even with, um, uh, with the Bible can we say, that doesn't make sense. Please clarify. Well, you know, if you really want to get confused, just go down the street to a Buddhist temple and they'll tell you there is no self. Right, there is no self, right? Mm. And so it's like, what do you mean by that? Oh, gosh, the, the, your, the work begins. The work <laughs> begins. Um, <laughs> You're looking to deal with what's not there. <laughs> correct, correct. So my, my interpretation, my little assessment of that particular situation is why is this stuff so foreign? Why does this trigger people? Is that the psychotherapies a lot and the medical model a lot, and even the Bible to a huge extent. It's assuming that we are our personality. We are our persona. And really, it's like, that's your ego's manifestation. And, and one could argue that your persona, your personality is simply what your ego is using to resist what the soul wants or what the soul is pushing for. I understand that viewpoint, and I think there's a lot of validity to it, but the deeper underlying current is that the persona is the mask of the Correct. soul, right? Yeah. The, the soul is eternal. The soul is God consciousness within, which gets into a fairly deep issue to really understand that. But if God is God, by definition, God is that for which there is no other. Right. God is prime source. So whatever, whatever you think or fantasize or believe is the source of all existence that's God. Therefore, the soul can only be a product of God, and without a soul, you can't be conscious. We call people zombies if they don't have a right, soul, right? right? Yeah. So they're, they're just robotic existence. So the point being, though, is that the soul is really God as subject within the individual. So the subject is the you know this, but for the audience, the subject in you is what is listening to our conversation right now. We are the object of your awareness. So you're hearing my voice right now. I'm the object of your awareness. When Jerry talks, he's the object of your awareness. But the I, the I am in you, is what's listening but the real truth is that God is the subject inside of all sentient beings and all the objects which become the other are also the subject of God being perceived as an object. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a very, very tricky little trick that God has to play with itself because without that, God cannot know itself and nor can God have love. And when you realize that because consciousness exists, by definition, God must be conscious, then God also is conscious that it's terribly alone, yeah. the most alone you could possibly be. Yeah. I mean, when you're God, there is no other. There is no other. So there's only one way to look when you're God, and that's inside of yourself. And when you look inside of yourself, you dream relationships into existence, and when you dream relationships into existence, you now have the ability to experience love. And it's very interesting, too, because if you look at psychological research on what happens when prisoners are put into isolation in, in the hole, usually within about three days, they start having created imaginary friends mm. because Ooh. the human being is a social creature and without a means of relating, it begins to deteriorate in its sense of self. Yeah. So then the only way they can survive is to create imaginary friends. Mm. And it, if it, for the Christians, it says in the Bible that we are created in God's image. So it's you can really learn about God by studying human beings. Of course, you can study the whole of nature and the universe, but you can learn a lot about God. So the point is, if God's conscious, then Consciousness in us is a quality of God. Yeah. If God has an inner experience of itself, soul, then that's where we get our inner experience of ourself, but we can't know who we are without relationships. Right. Just as why God can't know who it is without relationships. Right, right. But because there's no one to relate to, God has to dream these relationships up. And so what do we do when we get alone? We start making shit up. <laughs> right. When yeah. we don't, we, when we don't have love for ourselves, 
then we might create a persona that makes us look better or sound better yes. than we really are Absolutely. so we can get love. So the soul is actually God as the subject that projects its awareness or consciousness onto the world as object. But you see, if I project my awareness and my consciousness onto Jerry, I see an object. But the funny thing is, is that the same subject that's listening to my voice right now in you is identical to the one in me. We right. just give them different names. Right, right. And so that's how God makes love. And that love, by the way, takes two, right? An I and a thou. And mind takes two because you have to have a flow of energy and information between two points before you can have any consciousness of. See, if you have a computer, there has to be somebody putting information into it and taking information out of it, or you have no point. There's nothing to process. Correct, yeah. Right, there's a process going on. So mind is really a process of the flow of information. Energy can be processed, but mind doesn't require energy as much as it requires information. For example, um, you can have an idea what you'd like to eat for lunch, but that idea doesn't have to contain any energy. Just like the page, the typewritten page here, those symbols don't really require any energy to be there. So there's information. Right, right. It's when you act on information, sure. you have to have energy. And without information, you, go, you don't have any way to go from the no thing of God to create form. If you have no body, you have no form. How would I have a conversation with you? Right. So in order to take the pure energy of God and bring it into form, you have to have energy. And that's what the word information means, in formation, energy in formation. So the whole world, the universe, and all of us are actually icons for God. Oof symbols right that point back to something see i'm talking to jerry right now and i'm looking at jerry but i can make the mistake of thinking that jerry is jerry in other words if it's a fat jerry or a fit jerry or whatever i can actually think that that's jerry yeah but jerry is the guy that decided not to be fat yeah yeah and jerry's the guy that decides whether he <laughs> believes in god or doesn't believe in god and I, I can't know that Jerry. I can only know what Jerry expresses to me. And there's the river you were fishing in. Mm -hmm. I can know the guy holding the pole, but it's impossible to know the soul, which is the river flowing through him, because that is a part of God that only Jerry can know. Yeah. I can relate to it, but I can't know it. Yeah, and not having that relationship for so many of us it's, it's just like the biggest tragedy, in my opinion, that it's there, it's always calling to us, it's always speaking, but we create all these resistances to it. You know, if this is something that's intriguing you, it's worth the look. It is worth the look to get down, to get in touch with this, because there, <laughs> there's no better person to get to know than yourself. You know, that's the primordial question, who am I? I mean, that's what all yogis sure. pursue. Yeah. Because what the word yoga means the same thing as the word religion, to link back to connect to. We're always trying to figure out who, who we are. Anybody that's been orphaned always wants to know who its parents were because without your parents, you don't know who you are. You don't yeah. have a sense of identity. Who's my clan? Who's my tribe? Who are my people? Yeah. Why do I have these tendencies? Why do I have this color of skin? Why, why do I have these preferences? Where do my roots come from? Because I can't know who I am if I don't know where my roots were planted right. or are planted, right? Right. So real religion and real spirituality is really a quest to understand who is it that's inside of me having this experience. And if I don't have a relationship with the person inside of me having an experience, then I'm left with nothing but the ideas that have been programmed into me and that other people impose upon me. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Yes. And so here we are with the World Economic Forum saying God is bullshit, the soul is bullshit, yeah. you're a hackable animal, you'll yep. own nothing and you'll be happy. Yep. So there's the imposition of somebody else's ideas. Yeah, it's terribly inconvenient if you ask me. That sounds very, very not in line with what I would like to do. No, and it, <laughs> but the thing is, you see, is if you don't have 
an anchor in the roots of the I am of yourself. You don't really know who it is that wants to be free or why they want to be free. Right, yeah. So you really become kind of like a vacuum that can be lent out to anybody to sweep up poop or sweep up glass or whatever someone wants to do with it. And a vacuum's never going to say no because it's just a machine. Right, right, right. Who's saying no? I don't know. Right. And so that that's that's the thing. Who's saying yes who's and saying who's yes saying no? no yeah. Right. And so until you go backwards into yourself and say, you know, why is it that I have these kinky sex <laughs> desires or that I have this burning urge to be a millionaire or whatever? Or why am I not happy with my breasts or mm-hmm. y- you know, whatever part of your body it is that you've identified as your deficit? But the key point I'm driving at is that if, if, if a person doesn't take the time to go deep enough inside of themselves to see where these thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, beliefs, and behaviors are coming from, then everything's a symptom of something invisible and intangible. And how do you actually help the person inside there when you don't know who it is that keeps making the decisions that keep creating the pain and the problem? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's it's it's very likely it's a very likely setup to find yourself in that victim mentality in that victim role because firsthand experience, you know, it's been less than 10 years ago since I was in that state myself and it literally does feel like life is happening to you. Yes. Yeah, and then that means you're out of control. Correct. 100%. And but when, who's out of control? Well, that's the question, <laughs> right? Um I mean, most kids would be pretty scared if they were driving down the road and all of a sudden their mother or father that was driving the car just disappeared. But the car was going 65 miles an hour down the freeway and there's nobody in the front seat. The point I'm making is we're all like that car driving down the road 65 miles an hour in traffic, but many of us are not even aware of who's driving the car. And no brakes. And so when we keep crashing, we... we, we, we it's got to be somebody else's fault. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Because I'm not driving. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not driving. I thought I was driving. Yeah. But I clearly wasn't. So it's, you know, and, and this links to corporate health because the corporate environment is seldom an environment in which people are there because it's a calling from their soul. Yeah. It's almost always a means of meeting survival needs or creating the money that will give them the freedom they want. But the problem is, is oftentimes the money that they they want to create the freedom they want isn't actually the freedom that the soul of them wants. It's the freedom that matches the illusions of our culture. Yes. For example, if I have a big enough house, I'll be happy. If my bank account's got a certain amount of money in it, I'll be happy. But what do people find? They've get they got the perfect lips, they got the plastic surgery, they got the this, they got the that, but all of a sudden they realize they're not happy. Yes. And yes. so this just goes on forever. Yeah. Be- because ultimately they don't know who it is that they're trying to make happy. And so it's really like a, a ghost in a machine. Though most people think the Czech Academy is only for health and medical professionals, we all know just how many people in the world today are struggling to care for their body and look and feel the way they want to. Sadly, body weight challenges, energy challenges, joint aches and pains, digestive and eliminative problems, illnesses, diseases, and mental-emotional imbalances continue to rise among the public worldwide. By now, you'd think that most people would have come to realize that running to doctors isn't working and it's time to get involved in their own diet, exercise, lifestyle, and learn to create health instead of medicating chronic ailments. The Czech Academy is designed so that anyone can learn what they need to heal, balance, and create health and well-being, regardless of educational or professional background. In fact, several of my own patients over the years were so amazed at how much better they felt after implementing the changes I supported them in making that they decided they wanted to help others and changed careers and became Czech professionals. Year one of the Czech Academy is excellent for anyone who wants to learn to be their healthy best, and it offers how to eat, move, and be healthy, holistic lifestyle coach level one online, integrated movement science level one online, scientific core training, scientific back training, and program design. 
Year one graduates will be empowered to create their own health and fitness programs and inspire everyone in their lives with undeniable results. The Czech Academy is also a tremendous option for anyone looking to make a career transition, particularly because you can complete your studies and work full-time so that you don't have to take a hit in your income. Gavin Jennings, CEO of the Czech Institute, and I designed the Czech Academy in this way specifically so that each student got adequate hands-on training to really test what they were learning and be able to get questions answered by skilled instructors and mentors along the way. We are now accepting Academy Fall Semester Applications. To submit your applications to the Czech Academy, go to chek.group forward slash L4 number 4 D Academy. That's Czech, C-H-E-K dot group forward slash L4 D Academy. Anyone can get healthy and vital and together we can definitely make the world a better, healthier place for the children and for our collective future. Yeah, I know you're familiar with Maxwell Maltz, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah Psycho-Cybernetics. Psycho-Cybernetics, beautiful book. Yeah, and here this guy was. He was a plastic surgeon. Yeah. And he was, his portals were open enough to listen to his soul and be like, I just fixed her boobs, but she's complaining about the size of her boobs again. I just fixed her nose. Like, she's yeah. complaining about the size of her nose. It, it doesn't look like anything's different. If you've made the decision or you have that, if you're being run that by that belief that it's never enough, it never will be. Yeah. It never will be in... And the whole chasing of chasing of the money, chasing of the status, chasing of the acceptance. Again, acceptance of who? Acceptance of what? what wh- yeah. When do you start accepting yourself? And if we take a look at you know archetypal development and and being stuck in our in our wounded and perpetual child, it's the part of you that wants to experience life, that wants to be your best self that wants to be in joy, that's the part of us that we deny. And then, so what do we create? We create that, you know, like one could say that's maybe the light side of the inner child. But what, what do we create is that further manifestation of that child archetype, that, that child mindset. And once we're there, at least this was my case, and, and, and what I've seen with a lot of my clients is every action you take, because it's on that on that initial belief of I'm not enough or I'm not worthy, whatever. And that leads to that perpetual child state. Every action that you take after that just further solidifies that and further compounds the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we, and we're 50 years old, wake up one day and we're 50 years old. And we had more reverence and more understanding about the world than maybe when we were five, 10 years old. Mm-hmm. How Because you didn't have anything in the way of it. Yeah. Yeah, and then it's real easy to be in that situation. Just go, oh, I guess life sucks. Mm -hmm. It's like, does life suck, or did you create a life situation that you're not happy with? Yeah, and I think it's even hard to say, did you create it? Because most people are just enacting their programming. You know, most people recapitulate their parents' lives, which is why Jung said all children are tasked with the unfinished business of their parents' life. So true. Like if we don't look back and say, how did I get my ideas about sex? How did I get my ideas about money? How did I get my ideas about God or not God? Or how did I get my ideas about um, what a marriage is supposed to be? How did I get my ideas about what success is versus what happiness is? You know, Maxwell Maltz says, success is getting what you want and happiness is wanting what you get. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's quite a key distinction. But you see, my point is, is when we, most always when I'm working with people that are in a crisis like you're describing going through, I have to say, I have to take each of the beliefs that I can see are getting in the way of their own healing or their own freedom or that are the, shall we say, the the etiology of the behavior uh, or the choices that led to the behaviors that got them in the trouble they're in and say, okay, well, you know, where did you get that belief from? Mm-hmm. And almost always tracks right back to something that they learn, usually in the first 12 years of their lives, right. before their ego really had any discernment. So the child's like a walking tape recorder mm-hmm. that records every sight, sound, smell, touch, experience. Yeah. And then that's, that's like the soil that the seed grows in. So if you 
metaphorically poison the soil, you're, you can't expect to get a healthy tree that makes healthy fruit. Uh, yeah, it can't happen. Right? So the, the kind of like the who am I question, you have to go back to the soil and say, okay, this is how my persona got built. But really the who am, as I, who, who am I is who is the soul that came into the body within this family, within this culture? And ultimately what you see is that the limitations that we create or first are created for us, but then we create by continuing to energize them. Yeah. Um, that That's the part of us that paradoxically needed to be in the situation that all of us come into the world and in which things are imposed upon us because that's how we learn to have a mind. Right. Because if you don't have good and evil, shouldn't, shouldn't, light and dark, do, don't do, success, failure, male, female, then you have no way to process information. So there's no way to actually make meaning out of an experience. Mm -hmm. So the the strange and wonderful thing about all this is you, first you have to build a mind, then you have to blow it. Yeah. Right? Yep. And that's why the psychedelic craze is so strong because when people are trapped in their mind and they don't know how to change it and they hear of other people having these union experiences or feeling free for the first time, it's because they found a substance that will blow their mind. Mm -hmm. Right? And what does that mean? It means it, it knocks your ego out of the control seat the problem is, is then the river of the unconscious opens. So you might have one or two trips to heaven, but you might have 40 to hell before <laughs> you ever get back to heaven. Yeah, yeah. And so the key thing is, is that I'm pointing out is that all these challenges that we all go through and that we are going through at every level is actually coming to the realization that the mental, emotional gymnasium is where we have the forces that allow us to reach the point where we can say, I don't have to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. I don't have to believe that. I don't have to stay in this job. I don't have to even believe the thoughts I keep telling myself that I'm not good enough or I'm not sexy enough or I'm not strong enough or whatever it is. I can actually step back, but until you get clear on what it is that you want more than what you've got, you don't really know what to recreate. Correct. Right? So yes. what you what you can do is you say, okay, I want a sex change, which is getting to be popular. Yeah, it's a thing. Not 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 because of it's not because it's something innate in human beings, but because it's being brainwashed into people. But the point is, so you change your sex, but you still haven't addressed the person that was uncomfortable in their other sex. Yes. And the same thing happens, and I've seen countless interviews with people that got sex change and realized how terrible of a thing it was because it didn't work. Yeah, yeah. Right? It made so, things worse. So the point that I'm making is if you don't get clear on what it is that your heart wants and what it is that really gives you that sense of being alive, then you'll keep trying things mm -hmm. like changing your garment right? And suicide is really, I'm so tired of wearing this mask, I don't know how to get it off, so yeah. I'm just going to kill it. Yeah, just put me back in the womb. Yeah, yeah, just throw me back into the ocean again Yeah, and let me dissolve. But the the real issue that we're describing here is, is, and I'm using the sex change, if you still haven't come to your heart, because the paradox is God is what creates the soul, and God is not male or female. God's male and female mm -hmm. at the same time. Right. We all have those qualities in us. So then if you get back and say, you know, what is it that really makes me feel the most alive? Well, most people agree it's the experience of giving and receiving love. Well, once you get clear on that, you say, well, what is it that I most enjoy doing that's an expression of my love? Well, it could be art. It could be building. It could be um manufacturing things that help people's lives be easier it could be a million things yeah, right could be anything but, but the the key thing is, is is it something that you have identified on your own that you want to at least explore 
before you make decisions that are irreversible. Right, right, right. You can't have a mind until there is a duality created, and you can't have a mind until there's some form of resistance. Because if you were unconditional love, there would be no way to identify yourself as this or that, as me or you. So once we have relationship, I, thou, mom, dad, me, brother, sister, cow, chicken, pig, world, sun, solar system, galaxy. Now what we have is a way to direct our energy. So I can direct my energy to you and my attention to you and my flow of thoughts to you. And then you can reciprocate. And so now there's a flow of energy and information. I can feel your presence. I can see how you respond to what I'm saying. You can see how... And so now we actually have an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information, which is the definition of mind by Dan Siegel. And so, interestingly though, you see that in that process you have the two prerequisites for love. There has to be an I and a thou, and I define love as the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self and or other. So if you're loving yourself, then you say I love me. So there you have the you duality. Die, yeah, yeah. An I and a thou. And you also have the prerequisites for a mind. Two points of sentience, the, the witness and the body, which is obviously sentient. It tells you when you're hurting it or when you've overfed it or when it needs to go to the toilet. And so what the beginning of life is, is putting us into a matrix that by definition creates a gestalt or a viewpoint or a, a self-view, a worldview that almost always leads to trouble <laughs> because you can't actually get the truth of who you are out of a duality because yeah. you're ultimately the product of a unity called God, yeah. which is God consciousness. And only when a person reaches the point in their life when they realize that they're acting out almost like a mechanical process, the programming yeah. that's been imposed upon them, only when they realize that and see how much pain it is, do they say, ah, it's up to me to reprogram this thing. Yes. But I have to first decide what is fulfilling to me. I have to first decide for myself what is happy making for me, what gives me, not mom, not dad, not the world, a sense of meaning. What are the values that if I live by seem to actually open my life up and make me feel more connected to self, other, and world? The difference is now you're in the position of being an adult, which means I have to take responsibility for programming my own biological computer avatar self vehicle so that I can further engage the relationship of the rest of myself and ultimately come to the realization that everything that I thought was other is actually some aspect of me, which is doing exactly what it needs to do so that I can have a relationship because ultimately there's nothing here but God. Right. Therefore, if we don't go through this process, we not only don't help God wake up to itself, but we don't have the capacity or the agency to be novel creators, and God loves to create. Obviously, look at the universe. Yeah, yeah. So if we the don't, ultimate manifester. if we don't start taking responsibility for our creative agency, then we just get in the habit of being a photocopy machine. Yeah, yeah. And doing what everybody else is doing, and that's when um, the world gets flat. That's you know what Ken Wilber calls flatland. Yeah, yeah. That's why people have to come home from work and drink a bunch of yes. alcohol and watch mindless television. Because they have to create a world in which they can actually have more freedom and release from their perceived responsibilities and the weight of the mind that they carry. And so anything that helps you stay unconscious gives you this sense of freedom. But the reality of it is you don't realize that the longer you stay unconscious, the more you stay in the Mexican finger trap that you've been programmed with right. and that you've fallen into and called normal. Right. Right. So really the whole crisis, and you know, we're coming to this whole corporate thing, the, the corporate world is really just an extension of the mind of humanity 
creating something that's very machine-like in most cases. There's not a lot of novelty. Usually only, you know, Steve Jobs had the novelty, but everybody else is just putting parts together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have to come to the point where we say, what is it that I want to invent? And what is it that I want to create? And what is it that I'm willing to do the labor of mothering into the world because it gives me and hopefully others some sense of joy or satisfaction or agency. But until we actually come to the point where we realize that we have this creative ability and that we can co-create with others and we can make things interesting and beautiful and we can, you know, decorate homes and be a massage therapist and make bodies feel better and get the joy of that. I mean, the sky's the limit, right? Yeah. The, the menu is large. Yeah, yeah. Take your but pick. paradoxically, isn't it true, though, when you're in a crisis like you've described, it's like the menu just narrows down and down and down. Oh, and you see you yourself through a pea shooter. Yeah, it's almost yeah. like you're getting tunnel vision and it and it stifles, it chokes the human soul Literally. to the point where it, it starts to be think, maybe I don't belong here yes. anymore because there's nothing for me here yes. anymore. But really, that's the pressure See, that narrowing down is the pressure that forces you back inside. Mm -hmm. So instead of looking at the mirror on the outside, you have to go into the mirror on the inside and go into self-reflection and then say, well, what, who is it that's actually was born? And what is it that my mom and dad gave me that's worth keeping? And what is it that I got to discard? Because if I keep repeating those behaviors and I just get to be a recapitulation of mom and dad, they're not doing so well or the world, and it's not doing so well. But once somebody turns itself back to the inside and finds the creative agent, the soul, then the sky's the limit. Yeah. Yeah, there's no, no stop signs. Nothing in your way at that point. No. Most of your clientele comes from the environment you came out of because you understand that mm -hmm. environment. Hi, everybody. I don't think I have to convince you that the number one killer and the number one source of disease and dysfunction and disarray in people's life is stress. Well, I came across the best stress relief product I've ever used in my life, and I'm not bullshitting you. This stuff works. I've given it to friends. I've tested it regularly. It's absolutely functional, useful, tastes good, highly nutritious, super high quality. It's called de-stress. It's by Ned. In fact, it's so important for me that you understand how and why this works. I've got Adrian here, co-founder of Ned and Formulator, to tell us about this product, which I highly recommend. Yeah, well, Paul, this is this is near and dear to my heart, as I was just uh, telling you offline, which I'm sure I'll share on the podcast here at some point. My own journey towards Ned started with my own burnout. Yes. A panic attack I had in front of 75 of my employees and completely completely threw me for a loop. The staggering figures around mental health and anxiety speak for themselves. So many of us, I think ourselves included, are just too familiar with stress, anxiety, and all these cortisol spikes that come with the pressures of the world we live in today. Yes, We've also been so conditioned to too quickly reach for prescription drugs or, or to self-medicate with substances like alcohol, all things that can be addictive and come with a long list of side effects. When in fact, natural solutions like exercise, time in nature, and, and plant-based solutions can be all we need to bring ourselves back into balance. So that's why we got together with our amazing team of formulators to craft the ultimate natural alternative for stress relief. And as you mentioned, we call it the Ned De-Stress Blend. It features organic full-spectrum hemp and organic ashwagandha, which are both sourced through our Farm to Net Alliance that we designed to procure the best botanical ingredients that actually work all while supporting independent, organic, regenerative farmers across America. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, yes. And it also features a lesser known cannabinoid called CBG, rightfully nicknamed the mother of all cannabinoids. So this is, think about CBD and all you might have heard about that. CBG is just levels above. So the result is a cleaner, side effect free solution for finding balance, tranquility, and and really, at the end of the day, what we always talk about is unlocking our innate abilities to thrive. And so many of us live in those prisons of stress. We have it available in both tincture and vegan capsules. So all you have to do is go to helloned.com and use the code CHECK, that's C-H-E-K, to get 15% off your first purchase. Plus, every order is backed by our 60-day stress-free guarantee. 
So if you don't feel a significant improvement in your stress levels, we'll give you your money back. No questions asked. It works extremely well. And as I learned from Adrian, you can even add it to coffee to smooth out the coffee experience and have a combination of a nice lift without all the buzz, which is a great addition. So give it a try. It's definitely the best de-stress product I've ever used in my life. And you got a great offer and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Enjoy. Can you share looking back from the present and from the knowledge base that you have now regarding physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being and give us an overview of the kinds of things that you find, not necessarily the problems, but what's underlying the problem. First, tell me, what are some of the common problems? If you had to say what are the three most common issues people come to you for help with from that corporate world, what are they? And then the next step would be when you look into it, what's actually driving that? I would say like succinctly, I could probably answer your first question just under one umbrella. And that is what I'm doing isn't working. And why can't I find happiness and still work the 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week, make all this money? Um, They think it's something other than that. So they want to have their cake and eat it too. How are they showing up though? Is it digestive trouble, back pain? What are the, what are the things? Yes. Because yes. most people, unless they're pretty hip already, that's one of the challenges of being a check professional because most people come to them thinking they're personal trainers mm-hmm. and they want to flatten their abs yes. or they want to, you know, maybe get rid of back pain or, but most of it's physical stuff. And most of it's stuff that they've seen lots of other people for and it didn't work. Yeah. Yep. Because, you know, Czech professionals in in general are much more expensive to see. So you don't normally run to them first unless you're pretty savvy already to begin with. So I'm just curious, how are they how are they presenting to you symptomatically saying, Jerry, help me with this? What are the common things that that you see coming from that environment? Yeah, so it's a it's it it really is a mixed bag, but it it it's all boiled down to some sort of energy issue. Right. Okay. There like you go. I have a back pain and I can't do this. I've got digestive issues, so I can't do this. And and if I'm being honest, they're coming to me and it's almost like they're hoping that I catch on to what they're really saying. Yes. So you have to listen past the words. And they they they're we're so good at this and the people, maybe I've just been so lucky with the people that I've, I've worked with, but they're very good at guiding me to the right questions. Yeah. You know, it's a look in their eye. It's a change in their posture. You know, it's a facial expression, what have you, but there's, I'll ask a question. They'll give me a response. And then there's like a, so there's this, this reaching out, please, please dig deeper. Yeah. And I think they're doing that with their doctors and they're doing that with their mm. counselors and their physical therapists. And But they're not getting listened to. They're not to. getting it. They're not getting it because they're yeah. talking to someone who doesn't do that with themselves. Right. Yeah. So that's how, that's how they're showing up. And without fail, it's boiling down to their belief system, their belief structure. Namely, how do you see yourself? Like, what is that? What, 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 when I say... When I, when I pre- present a scenario, right? I show you a picture of somebody, they're smiling, they're happy, they got a great family, maybe they're fishing on a boat and it's a nice boat so you know they've got some money, but they're truly happy. So they, this, person, this person has sourced their four doctors, their six principles, mm-hmm. and they are living their legacy and that's the dream they've built and that's why they're so happy. When I show you that picture, can I put your face there and will you believe it? And without fail, it's a no, and when we get down to it, there is a deep-seated belief about themselves that they're operating on, that they're not even aware exists, but they fully believe it's true. Give me an example. Uh, so an example, um, a little backstory. When, when she showed up, um, she, was, uh, she was battling dissociative disorder, and she had undiagnosed uh, I don't know what the actual term is. What I'm familiar with it being called is is um, kinesthetic amnesia. Uh, yeah, I think you're talking about derealization. I'm not. I'm not sure what the actual clinical term is. What she was experiencing. It's almost like somebody's um, not in themselves, or they're 
uh, walking in sort of a perpetual daydream. Exactly. And she'll, she'll say, you know, she still uses all the time. It's like, I was a zombie walking around. When she first showed up, we did a gait analysis and it was like, um, she didn't have legs. It was like she had two almost concrete stumps and she could move at the ball and socket joint, but nothing else was happening. And so that was extreme dissociation. She couldn't, she couldn't feel her legs. Um, she, when she drank water, she like couldn't feel it in her mouth and going down. That's someone that's checked out. She was completely checked out. Obviously, you know, she's got a life history that explains it, a life history of, you know, various traumas and abuse. Um, but what she didn't realize was that everything that you're doing to compensate for you feeling like something's missing and that you're missing out on something, if you just turn that attention inward and just realize you can't feel your legs, you can't feel when you drink water, so you're missing out on everything. And... Um, through through the course of our work together and and um, everything else that she'd been putting in on, putting in on her own on her own time, she's gotten over that. She can now feel her legs. She now walks well. Uh, she can feel water going down her throat. But she realizes that not only was her strategy of feeling like she's not missing out on something creating her to miss out on everything because she wasn't turning the attention inward. Yeah, it was all externally focused. That. To experience all there is to experience in life every single day is to take care of your four doctors, your six principles. And I get text messages. Or it's like a Saturday thing. She sends me these long texts. Could this really be? Like, is this really possible for everybody to experience this much joy? And she's telling me about how she went for a walk, drank a bottle of water, and sat and watched the birds. Yeah. Right? As opposed to not wanting to experience that, not wanting to feel that, and go out and do some drugs, drink some alcohol, go hang out with some unsavory people. All as a resistance to just turning that radar towards the inside. Yeah, that's sort of the societal, cultural, actually world challenge, really. That's the corporate environment, isn't it? It is the corporate environment. You see, the thing is, is that if you become a cog in a wheel, then you're a cog in a wheel. Mm -hmm. And that's your identity. In the corporate environment, creativity is heavily shunned upon because then you change the outcome of the machine. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, you know, without a long history, but the entire history of our education system, it was developed by plantation owners who were slave owners. Yeah. And so they didn't want people to think for themselves because then they couldn't control them. And they didn't want creativity because they were developing mass assembly, whether it be farming procedures or textiles or manufacturing shoes or, you know, machine parts. So when you have a machine-like process, it requires a machine-like consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you spend 40, 50, 60 hours, in fact, one of the main reasons that the school system was developed was to keep the children occupied longer so that the they could get more work out of the slaves so the what we call school is actually an indoctrination process so you would be a more effective slave right and wouldn't think for yourself and what do we have now a worldwide education system that teaches you what to think but not how to think yeah yeah so when you take that and you say, okay, there's a person like you're describing that lives in the corporate world who goes to work every day. And, you know, most of those jobs are fairly narrow. Like I'm a claims adjuster. Yes. So all I do is look at claims and decide, is this, will we pay for this or will we not? And it's not necessarily a question of whether the person's claim is authentic. It's a question of what is the rules that the company yes. has designed so that we pay as little as possible and charge as much as possible. So then the person has to either confront the morality of those decisions or not. But the point I'm making is you see there's a narrow, think of an antenna. Uh, another name for an antenna is a waveguide. If you want to capture a signal and get it to go into your radio or your television, you got to make sure the frequency follows the wave guide into the receiving and amplification system so that you can get the signal. But if that antenna was connected to something else or didn't have a clear 
channel of transmission, then your signal would jump in and jump out and you wouldn't be able to make anything out of it. So what happens is it narrows our focus down to such a, a tiny aspect of life that you get someone that's done nothing but adjusting claims for 10, 12, 15, 20 years. And so then when they walk out to their garden and they've got ants or you know worms or something, they don't know what to do about it because it doesn't fit within the waveguide of the consciousness that they've been structured into to fit into the machine. And so what do they do is they just ask somebody else and they say, well, you just kill it with this poison. Yeah. And then that's just a procedure. Yeah. But then there's no thought about, well, uh, what if I eat the carrots that I just poisoned? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you see, because that would be an act of creativity to think outside of the box. So it's as though the machine of the industrial complex has captured the minds, the freedom and the creativity and then when a person lives that way, they don't feed, you know, doctor happiness, doctor diet, doctor quiet, doctor movement, nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement. But most important is what, you know, what, what is happy making for you? Yeah. I, I've never met a single person in my life that said my favorite thing to do is, is adjust claims all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, lying on your deathbed, it's like, boy, I'm sure glad I made that extra million that, you know, 14 generations are going to get to spend for me. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't happen. By the time those fourteen generations come, that million won't be worth what <laughs> about like squat. No. ten thousand dollars. No, it'd be a month's rent. You know, I've been pioneering the concept of holistic health for a long time, and just to give you an interesting bit of history, when I founded the institute in nineteen ninety five, I wanted to call it the Corrective Holistic Exercise Kinesiology Institute, mm -hmm. but all the marketing people that I consulted at the time said, nobody knows what that word means. You're going to ruin your business because people mostly associate the word holistic with hippie stuff. Right, right. So I had to change it. They said, you got to come up with a better name that's going to be more attractive. So I called it corrective high performance exercise kinesiology because back then, if you were bigger, stronger, faster, then whatever I could tell you that would make you big, you know, take this pill, to, then it would sell. Yeah. So I had to kind of trick people into holistic health by showing them how being holistic would actually give them their All it. goals, right? Yes, yes. But then several years later, we had another meeting with marketing people. And interestingly enough, some very intelligent woman who worked for an agency that we had hired said, well, you know, what you really do is holistic health. Why don't you change your name? And I'm like, <laughs> and so Penny and the whole staff looked at me like, oh boy, Paul's been trying to tell us this for the last 10 years. <laughs> Can't hide the truth. It's yeah. just a beach ball under the water. <laughs> but the, yeah, the beach ball wants up. So the point I'm leading to, the question I'm leading to is how much of a challenge are you having with people coming to you with their various problems and you taking the approach that you take, but them being resistant to looking into the issues that ultimately have to be looked at to bring them into wholeness. It's a lot less now than it was a few years ago. Yeah. Like the word holistic. A couple of years ago, myself, I was using it very sparingly. Now, people are like, I want a holistic program. I want a holistic approach. That's great. So yeah, they're a lot more open-minded now. Uh, I would say that the deeper people are entrenched in their own dogmas when they show up, the more work you've got to do to bring the truth to the surface with them, mm -hmm. whatever that is, whether that be religion, parental programming. Yeah, anything. You know, it, yeah, exactly. It could be their personality. They might be the type that one, one dis undesirable event in their life may, says, I'm never doing that again. I'm never trying. I'm never that might be that, that type of person. Mm -hmm. so, so all those things are in play. But I would say overall, it's been really noticeable, especially the last couple of years, about how open people are by the time they get to me. Right. Now, one of the things that I found very helpful, I mean, everything's got a light side and a dark side, uh -huh, yeah. you know, like the, the whole pandemic, um, it really shocked a lot of people yes. into awakening to their own responsibility. And so the one thing that even the dark forces of the media kept saying over and over again, which kind of I laughed at. It, that was people with comorbidities have the highest rate of getting COVID infections. Yeah. Shocker. And so what are all those comorbidities? Obesity, diabetes, um, 
heart issues. I mean, all cancers. All, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the, the list of is, is long, right. right? And the percentage of the human population in the world that's got multiple com- comorbidities now. Yeah. Multiple diagnoses, multiple diseases. Multiple prescriptions. Is, is very, very high. So the way I saw that backfire beautifully is the one thing people got if they didn't get anything else is they realized that the more unhealthy you are, the more likely you are to boom, die boom. from yes. this imaginary virus. <laughs> yeah. But you got to remember the placebo effect running backwards yes. is just as powerful. Yes, so yes. all you got to do is tell people something enough times they believe it yeah. and, and it works. So what was interesting to me, and it shot the sales up at the Institute through the roof, Especially on HLC I can one, imagine. holistic lifestyle yeah. level one, because that's my public. As you know, I'm saying this for the audience. It's yeah. the, it's the public access course for how to get healthy. It's the best value in health by a million miles. Thank you. I I tried to really tell people what they needed to know, but the the thing that was the common denominator is people came to the realization: I've got to start taking care of myself, and I got to go somewhere that has a track record of teaching people how to take care of themselves, not a bunch of f- fake shit. Yeah. And so that really, I think, was the was a great benefit for Czech professionals worldwide because people came out in droves going, you know, how should I eat? How do I exercise? Mm-hmm. What should I do? Yeah. And so that was sort of the the uh, the genius hiding in the bottle of darkness. You yeah, know? and that's been my my experience too. My anecdotal experience too is is seeing that people, like you said, have made that decision. Hey, I got I, I can't keep doing this to myself. I've got to get in a situation where if it does hit me, then I, I want to be the person who doesn't have to worry. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm sure you've heard me talk about the many injuries I've had doing many wild things from racing motocross to riding in the rodeo and crashing stock cars and being a paratrooper. And one of the things that's really helped me a lot to make my joints more comfortable and heal is collagen. And Bioptimizers has just come out with an amazing new product called Collagenius that actually goes way beyond anything we can get in the standard collagen supplementation classification. And I've got Mark Effinger here, who's the chief product officer at Bioptimizers, to tell us about their new product, which I'm very excited about. Mark, tell us what's unique about Collagenius. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, I, and I really appreciate this, by the way. So Collagenius came about um, as an accident of my lab assistant trying to compartmentalize different mushroom extracts from one to one all the way to a hundred to one. These are all medicinal mushrooms and they're all organic. And we were finding this really interesting overtone of chocolate and cacao coming out of these mushroom extracts. And the more extraction we got, the further we got down the extraction lane, the higher the, the chocolate notes would come out of these. So me being a, a, a more of a scientist, I was trying to cap these things. She being more of an incredible chef decided that what if we could flavor these up and us both being over 50 and me having some of the same experiences you have in breaking bones and tearing muscles and tendons <laughs> decided, wouldn't it be great if we could, if we could take the, the benefits of collagen and the restorative and, and tissue repair and combine it with these micronutrients that are available in mushrooms that activate the collagen and make it bioavailable. So we started blending those things up. And as a result, we came up with this nootropic, this brain enhancing mushroom stack that is also a super collagen enhancer. And those together became Collagenius. That's so amazing. I just love the exploration. I love the marriage of your wife's chef skills and your science skills. And that's just the magic of a healthy relationship. And that really describes my relationship with Bioptimizers. Just magical because I love all their products. I, I've always had a great relationship with Wade, and I love it because everything by Optimizers sells actually works. What a concept. So, hey, you guys, get your Collagenius at N-O-O-T-O-P-I-A, that's newtopia.com forward slash living number four and the letter D. That's newtopia.com forward slash living four D, and get your discount with Paul 10 on checkout. I can't wait to hear what you think about Collagenius. Enjoy. In my system of education, you know, the one, two, three, four model, what is your dream? What are you willing to grow for? What do you love enough to change for? When you have a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis. 
And then from there, we analyze the case, we do an assessment, and then we look at the relative state of balance within that person. Where are they doing too little? Where are they doing too much? Then we help them by designing a program and helping them establish values that are dream affirmative. And then we put that plan into a four doctor structure. So for happiness building, these are the things that you're willing to do. Movement. This is what is best for your body right now. This is the way we're going to fine tune your diet. And here's how you work on that so that you're getting what you need, not reading books about other people. Mm -hmm. Um, How much rest do you need? You know, the things that have to be in place. So the key point is first thing we've got to do is identify something they're willing to grow for and change for. Yeah. Um, so the two questions are what, how, what kind of challenges or how often do you find yourself in a situation where people just don't know what their dream is? And second question is what are the common belief systems that you see getting in the way of them either finding their dream or implementing the program once you've given it to them? Yeah, yeah. So the first part of your question, I would say 100%, if we were to round up, 100% of the people show up not knowing what their dream is. And what do you think the consequences of that is? The consequences of that is living someone else's dream and and creating everything. Or their nightmare. Yeah, or their nightmare. They they live their own personal nightmare or someone else's nightmare or uh, hypothetical dream scenario. Like, because as you know, a lot of people's dreams just aren't real. Yeah, that, that's why we have to qualify the dream. Correct. You know, just so the listeners know, a dream can also be a goal or an objective. Right. Dream, of course, is a word that has a sort of a childlike mystical quality to it when you don't really understand the depth of that word. What we're really asking is, what is it that inspires you to change and become you know, if your goal is, for example, to lose weight, then that w- we can call that your dream because that gives us a reason to get you to participate. Yeah. And a lot of people show up with these, these heady concepts and, yes. and that creates resistances. And so for those people, I just like to say, well, I get it. I get it. You can't, you can't, we, you know, it's not time and place for you, but let's just, let's just check out, take a deep breath here. And if you were to, if your soul was to create a vision for what your dream is, remember, there's no limits on your soul. Yeah. What would that look like? And that seems to open it up for them, but it really gets them in touch with the fact that you're, you're creating the resistance. Whatever resistance you're experiencing is created by you. Mm-hmm. And then that, you know, that helps segue into the second part of your question. W- when we talk about what's, what's getting in their way, what are the obstacles, right? And yeah. it's r- succinctly resistances, but what's creating the resistance? And without fail, it's, it's that the mother, father, God image you know, throwing them into survival mode and, you know, they find themselves bouncing around between the saboteur and the prostitute and, and the eternal child. So uh, there's a lot of programming, dogmas, uh, and I can'ts and I mustn'ts and I have tos. You know, I call those ant infections. Yeah, ant infections. Yeah, the ants. Would ant, mm-hmm. could ant, did ant, and should, should ant. ant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, they're very, they're very common. Why? Because who used to say that to us constantly? Parents and teachers. The people we outsourced our authority to. Right. Yeah. And that's exactly how the shadow gets created. Yes. Yes. When you tell the soul you can't be a musician. Right. You didn't do a good enough job. Right. Right. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't touch your genitals and make yourself feel good. You yeah. shouldn't. <laughs> you know, it feels like heaven. No, you're in hell. Don't drink, <laughs> don't drink the beer or the wine. Only we can do that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so... The, that's that. See, that's when our creative impulse and our instinctual drives get repressed, and that's the beginning of the development of the shadow. And so, unfortunately, that's ultimately the drive to creativity and freedom. Mm-hmm. So, the more you stifle creativity and freedom, the more it has to, the, the less human you are, right? Yes. And so, therefore, what happens is you bury your humanness in a dungeon called the self. Yeah. And then eventually the pressure is so great that it has to come out some other way. Mm -hmm. And so, how does it come out? It usually comes out in some socially acceptable way, such as addiction to alcohol. That's very socially acceptable. Uh It can come out as an eating disorder. That's quite socially acceptable. It can come out as a, a fixation. I'm going to be a bodybuilder and I'm going to forget about everything in my life except making my muscles bigger. And that gives me a way to not have to deal with the fact that I'm not really 
doing what I came to the world to do. Yes. And so and that's the neurosis. It's the pressure relief valve allows a person to dissipate this trap psychic energy so they don't commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Yep. The thing that I would love to know is is what are some of the things that you find fairly common that you can give almost anyone from the corporate environment to go back to that environment with that's practical that are like baby steps to health and freedom that almost anybody could apply. Yeah, so uh if you're talking about like specific, uh, uh, specific practices, specific things that they could do, right? Well, first of all, clean up your physiology. Take a look at how much are you sleeping? How much are you doing uh, things that make you happy? Right. How, how much are you actually moving? Why aren't you moving? Yeah. Um, and and f- from there, it's like everything that you're not doing. I mean, the four doctors are very simple. They're very basic. Yeah. So if I give you these four little areas of your world that you can work on, very yeah. simple. Yeah. I'll, we'll talk about four things today. Mm-hmm. I'll give you four things. How many of those of you don't pay any attention to? So awareness. That's the first gift you could give anybody. Mm-hmm. And whatever one they pick, happiness. Dr. Happy. Mm-hmm. Okay. What is it you believe about yourself that says it's okay to not look at Dr. Happy? Just take a look at your four doctors. Yeah. And whichever one of those is the most out of a line is probably where your biggest shadow is. And just say, what is it that I believe about myself that says that's not important for me? Right. Or or your biggest misunderstanding. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Change takes a lot of energy. Mm-hmm. Like yes. Overriding programming is hard to do. Immense. Yeah. Because, you know, do you remember the law of facilitation? Yes. When, yeah. when an impulse passes once through a given set of neurons to the exclusion of others, it tends to do so on a future occasion. And each time it traverses this path, the resistance will be smaller. The problem is the law of facilitation does not give a damn whether it's a uh, whether you facilitated a bad idea, a bad belief. Yeah, dream affirmative or not, uh, I don't a, care. A bad exercise technique or a good one, right? Right. It just so the point is because it's actually takes less energy to act out faulty programming even though it's destructive at the level of the cell or the nervous system it's the easier program to run. Yes. Right. So when someone's used to staying up till midnight watching the television that gets them the escape from the world they've created that they don't want to be in, like, yeah. then the idea of, oh, I've got to go to bed at 10 o'clock, but, I, but, I, but I, I'm going to miss my world. Yes. Right. This is what I live for. Right. Yeah. So that habit is very facilitated. Yes. Right. So, yes. and that's why the dream is so important because if you don't say to somebody, Ask yourself, is staying up till midnight moving you toward your dream or away from your dream? So the point I'm driving at is is if we don't look at food choices, if we don't look at water quality and water consumption, if we don't look at movement choices or lack thereof, then we don't liberate energy. Right. Therefore, we don't have the, the vitality and the capacity to make the change because if we don't get out of core survival issues, like if the body is starving for water or for food or for anything else, and it's sending you these messages, but that's being interpreted incorrectly. Oh, for example, I'm thirsty is commonly interpreted as I'm hungry. Right. I'm tired is commonly interpreted as I need soda pop, sugar, or water. So if we don't actually start showing them how to get the energy from natural foods and natural practices, then they keep auto reverting back to the old habit that keeps drilling them down deeper into the energy crisis. So paradoxically, the more they keep doing what they were doing, the more of an energy crisis they have, the more pain they have, and the more they know they need to change, but the less they can change right. because they don't have the energy. They're driving that 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 law of facilitation in deep. Yeah. And yeah. and it's kind of a self-reinforcing negative. Yeah. Yep. Right. So that's why the dream is so critical because if you don't qualify the dream, you know, and unfortunately, have you found that a lot of people actually respond to a negative motivator than a positive it's motivator? It's always, yes. In other words, a positive motivator is I'll be able to play with my grandkids and that'll make me happy versus if I don't make these diet changes, I'm going to end up in a hospital bed. Exactly. I found that most people respond more positively to a negative motivator than a positive motivator. Yeah, and it's the, the, that, that lack of awareness. You know, so so to, to, to tag on your point about the law of facilitation, 
is no matter what you do, any change is going to be uh, uh, require a lot of a lot of uh, energetic investment. Yes. But if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing or who the I is that's doing anything, you're literally throwing stuff against the wall and hoping it sticks. But more to the point, you're ma- you're getting way less miles per gallon on your efforts. Yes. It's so hard to take action on something when you don't know who's taking the action, what you're taking action for, and if this is the appropriate action. Right. You don't have all that. But if someone says, look. Which means there's not really a sense of meaning. So there's no, there's no connection for the flow of energy. Correct. If you can clearly define your dream, you know, and in my work, I do a lot of personality work with people and, and you know, we get down to like core beliefs and, and motivator, motivators and whatnot. But if you know what your core motivation is, you know what, what some of the limiting beliefs that are operating you are, you're starting from there and then you know your dream. And then you have somebody who can give you a plan that's really going to work for you. The law of facilitation running through that, that wet sand, so to speak, of changing the neural patterning, the sand gets a little drier then. The mm. ground gets a little more firm. You still yeah. got to put in the reps. Yeah. You've still got to override the 95-5 dynamic of the subconscious and conscious mind. Mm-hmm. You still got to do all that, but you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yeah. Right? So now it becomes... Uh, you know, to, to coin one of your phrases, now it becomes a labor of love and not just labor. Yes. And then the other thing too is is that I think it's important for everybody listening to realize it doesn't take huge changes to Mm-mm. make a big no. difference, right? Like, you know, I always tell people in the, in the, in our, you know, in, in HLC training, we have the vertical axis of the four doctors, which is movement and rest and introspection. So doctor happy, or doctor movement and doctor uh, quiet, and then the horizontal axis is doctor happiness and doctor diet. Doctor happiness is the control vector. So ultimately, doctor happiness is the one controlling how much you move or don't move, how much you rest or don't rest, how much you look into things, you know, self-reflection, um, meditation, what we would classically call spiritual practices. And it's also Dr. Happiness that's controlling Dr. Diet. Yeah. But if Dr. Happiness does not have enough energy to override its programming, Mm -hmm. then you can write the very best program in the world and somebody won't be able to do it because they'll just keep defaulting back to their habits because it takes too much energy to implement a new behavior. So the survival strategy is if I just keep doing what I was doing, I'll be okay, which it does it's it's not commonsensical no right but right. it's physiologically grounded yes and that, that's one of the problems with programming yes because the body gets easily programmed yeah i mean what is an addiction it's a program yeah what well, you know caffeine addiction the body's been programmed to believe it's going to have a external source of stimulation at a given time of day and so it adjusts the entire physiological system to run based on that input and all of a sudden the input's there and, and the whole thing's depressed at that point. Correct. Because where's my adrenaline kick? Correct. Where's my cortisol kick? Yep. So the point I'm driving at is that, and this is a hard thing even to get check professionals to do, but the reason it's hard to get check professionals to do is because they can't get over the hurdle that if someone's paying them 100 or 150 bucks an hour, and all they're doing is teaching them how to breathe, do Tai Chi, and get to oh. bed on time, that they're doing anything worth their money. And I'm like, you got to realize the hardest thing you can do is to get someone to do the simplest things in the oh, world. That's it. That's it. And so if you want to give them something that's worth the money they're paying you, then practice the art of behavioral change mm-hmm. and really learn how to work with people and their uniqueness and tell them what they want to hear. And give them what they need. What they want to hear is how making that little practice of taking that walk every day or using that Epsom salt bath and doing some journaling and getting to bed on time actually is getting them to their dream of playing with their grandkids, uh, climbing their Mount Everest, or maybe uh, getting out of a marriage that they don't want to be in anymore. And so if we focus on the free energy of movement, even if it's just walking, and we focus on the free energy of rest, and we focus on the increased clarity that comes from being present and with yourself, then there's there's not big changes needed at Dr. Happiness. You don't have to, you know, you could leave someone in quite a fucked up corporate job and say, look, let's just work on getting to bed on time, and let's just work on getting some breath and some movement. Yep. 
whether that be a spin bike put in your house or be a walk or, you know, working up, building up to X number of laps in the swimming pool or rotating between those so you don't get bored. Yeah. And when that energy starts to come online, it doesn't take people long to feel better. I mean, I've had people that in one week came back to me by just doing those simple things yes. and were amazed at how much better they felt. And so good that now you've got, you know, now you've got inspiration. Now you've got evidence that this works and we just keep building up from there. And when they have, then they start asking questions, I find. And mm -hmm. they, they, yes. they actually start saying, well, you know, maybe, maybe I really shouldn't be in this job because it's really hard for me to sleep well because sometimes I have to work till <laughs> 11 o'clock at night or midnight because I'm a nurse or I'm an emergency medical technician or I'm a, working in a factory that I have to work these shifts. And so all of a sudden when the energy is there, it's almost like the, the, the creative agency turns on and says, ah, oh, well, maybe I can change this. Yes. And I think that's one of the most important things for the listeners to hear is, is that it doesn't take a lot to get the vitality to become conscious enough to realize that you do have a need for and the ability to make change. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we can, we can, we can overcomplicate anything. But how many, how many words does it take to make a really good Zen koan? But not many. Not many, right? <laughs> and what do we appreciate about the most... Your name? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Who am I? Oh, yeah. shit. How much long do I have? You've got several <laughs> lifetimes to figure this out. Don't worry. Yeah. Paleo Valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar. I've got Autumn Smith, the creator of their superfood bars, right here to tell you about them. Autumn, what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars? Well, our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or GMOs or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars, or gluten or anything, but they're just whole foods. They're low in sugar. They're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them though is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors. That's awesome. And superfood bars also now come in lemon meringue and red velvet flavors too both of which are a big hit with my kids. All you have to do to get your superfood bars and save 15% is go to paleovalley.com forward slash Paul Check. That's C-H-E-K. No promo code is needed as your discount will be automatically applied. That's paleovalley forward slash Paul Check. I hope you love them as much as my family does. To go back to what us Czech practitioners really could be striving for is get out of our own way, obviously. Just being human, that's, that's, that's a thing for us. But just realize that all these books we're reading, all these classes we're taking, all this daily personal work that we're doing to be the best example, mm -hmm. that's not an attempt to show your clients how smart you are and how much you know. That is to be that person that can deliver as in Cohen in one sentence it's also to show people what's possible yeah and oh, i obviously. mean look you were you you said right in the very beginning you were unhealthy you were overweight you were yeah. depressed you were uh, anxious f you name it facing suicidal yeah. thoughts yeah 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 pre-contemplating uh, suicide before yeah i, I mean, even knew so, it. so there you are right yeah. and 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 here you are 43 years old fit as a 25 year old athlete i mean when you look at the state of the world right now if you were to go interview psychiatrists, psychologists, doctors, social theorists, behavioral change experts, um, social engineers, and ask them all, what do you think we need to do to bring the world into a state of balance and harmony? You would get documents that would be hundreds of pages long from some oh, yeah. of these people. Oh, yeah. And nothing would be in that document unless there was a peer-reviewed scientific study attached to what they had to opine on. Yes, probably. but the problem is all the peers would be oh, just as lost we as We know the problem. Else. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. just it. Yeah, peer review. That's, that's, that's consensus. Here's the punchline. Do you realize that everything we've just talked about boils down to if people would just move their bodies a little bit every day, Yeah. get some sleep, 
everybody needs eight hours of sleep a night until proven otherwise. Right. <laughs> and in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, I tell you why you need to be in bed about 10 o'clock instead of midnight, because your eight hours has got to be timed with the movement of the sun, mm -hmm. or you're going against your hormonal system. But the point I'm making is this. We've got grandiose changes we need to make in the world, but if we don't start with getting our bodies to baseline health, breathing fresh air, moving our bodies, drinking clean water, eating real food, and spending some time inside of ourselves getting clear on what it is that's really happy making for us and what is fulfilling and what is it that we really want to do with our life, then we will never have the energy and the sense of self-agency to do a damn thing and the sick, twisted criminals that are having a heyday right now will have no resistance because isn't it interesting that they're the ones that have engineered this very yes. issue into society so they would have no resistance. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, what I hear there is just the individual is going to be what saves the collective. That's the only way it can work. Take a bicycle wheel. Mm -hmm. 30, both bicycle wheels have 32 spokes. Each spoke in the wheel represents an individual. The rim connects them all together. That's the wholeness of all of us, the world. Now, what happens if all those spokes mismanage themselves to the point that they can't even do their 132nd right. of, the we of the work of holding the collective up? Yeah, I don't want to be a straight spoke. I want to be a 90 degree angle I don't spoke. want to work today. Yeah. yeah. Or I only want to do this even though it's killing me and it's part of the problem. So the point is, every spoke in the wheel has to distribute and attenuate the forces of the whole. And if we don't have our ability to do our part as an individual, then the rim breaks. It falls apart and the wheel collapses. And then you, life stops rolling. Yes, absolutely. Life stops rolling because this is the wheel of life we're talking about. Absolutely. And so uh, to close the podcast... If, if you're somebody that's ready to start doing this, not only can you hire a check professional, there's you know thousands of them out there all over the world, but you can go to my Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 1, HLC1 online, and learn all the basics that anybody can apply and just start with whatever you're willing to do today. Yeah. And you will begin to energize the one spoke that you're responsible for and begin to hold up your 132nd of the wheel and i will throw this last tip paul check tip in the formula i developed for helping people like this is one for 100 one percent a day of any one of your four doctors for 100 days and you are 100 percent improved yeah so what can you do that's a little bit more happy making for you one percent now how might that look well I love to read spiritual literature, but I don't have enough time. Okay, well, today you're going to read for how many minutes you got. Tomorrow you're going to say, I'm going to read 1% longer. It's 1% subjective, right? Yes, yes. So I'm going to read five minutes longer. And then 100 days from now, I'll be reading plenty enough that I will be able to say, now I have time. To, now now I, I don't need more reading. I need a little more walking. But the point I'm making is 1% a day with any one of your four doctors and 100 days and you're 100% improved. Mm -hmm. You're a completely different person. Right. And, you, and you've proven to yourself yeah. that you can be intentional about what you're creating, Yeah, put it in play, and see results. And the other thing is, is if you don't do it, then 100 days from now, you will be worse. You're going backwards. Yeah. You're going backwards. It's like standing in a river. You can't ever say you're standing in a river. Either you're moving forward or you're getting pushed back. And if you're standing in the river and you're not doing anything, you're the rock that's getting worn away by the water <laughs> and it. eventually you will leave this world. Yep. That's and it. that's called comorbidities. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be crying, poor me the whole way. <laughs> yes. And each comorbidity means you're getting closer to meeting your true self. <laughs> <laughs> the difference is you may not be conscious when it happens. That's right. There will be no resistances at that stage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if people want to work with you, Jerry, uh, where do they find you and what services do you offer? And, and are there websites or anything else you want to direct? Yeah, yeah. To? Um, so you can uh, you can email me direct, uh, coachjerryhlc at gmail.com. Uh, 
Coach Jerry. Coach Jerry. H-L-C. H-L-C at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, you can, um, yeah, you can visit my website, uh, biohackingtruth.com. Um, and let's see, uh, services. Yeah, I, I offer the full check, the full check deal. Um, and uh, so I have different, different, program packages so if you want to focus on the physical body back pain neck shoulder pain things like that we have a we have a system for that uh also um individuation uh, i call it my transcend program Mm -hmm. where we really teach people to uh to get in touch with what they're creating and and where they're creating it from what belief structures are operating you Mm -hmm. and what are you doing to resist your 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 soul Really? Mm-hmm. How are you using your personality to not manifest your best self? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so uh, those are really my, my flagship offers. Every one of them has some of everything in it. So if you come to me for a personality program, I'm not just going to like not ask you about your physical state. Right. right? But it's, it's all about what are we going to focus on majorly and what, what's going to be our minor. So we've, yeah. got, we've got to really hone our attention towards your dream. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, that's what you can expect working with me. It's the, it's always a holistic program. It's always, it's always focused on what you want and what you need and where you're at currently. And it's, uh, it, it's given you the power back Yeah. to be your best personal physician, be your best personal psychologist, and be your best personal coach. And then when you're there, you're the best father, husband, wife, the president of company. And yeah. then you can take you and your tribe and you can impact the world however the heck you want. Yeah, I think that's too uh, also important too from the corporate perspective because especially people in management positions, yes. once they start improving their health and vitality, everybody around them starts asking how they're doing it. Yes, and 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 I am actually launching a corporate wellness program that's going to be attached to an app. So Good. the app is in the finalization stages of of the initial the initial launch, but within that, it's going to be it's going to be everything um obviously there's different levels Mm -hmm. but really we're not we're not holding anything back with with what we're introducing here and this is because i'm going to introduce it into the corporate world yeah and you can't show up to a corporate environment and not talk about things like well what beliefs are running you yeah and where are you spending your energy yeah what are you doing with your thoughts yeah so uh, from what i see in the corporate wellness programs it's a whole bunch of it's a whole bunch of here take this program you're going to get cheaper insurance rate the ceo is not going are my employees going to have a better life because of this? No, yeah. no. It, it, it's it's to get cheaper insurance rate. The company is taking advantage of someone spending someone else's money. But this, the, what I'm what I'm creating is designed to actually be effective, and to be a win win for the corporate uh, bosses, the corporate staff, uh, so that because the CEO is he's he or she has got to get their get their ducks in a row too. They've got to get information as well. Well, the better their staff does, the more money they make, the more money the corporate CEO gets. The more money the corporate CEO gets. And then we can say, you know why they're doing so well, sir? Because this is what we're covering with them. Are you interested? Yeah. And so it's, it's top down. It, it works from the top. And so long, as, so long as there's an environment where all the people on the payroll are, are keeping, um, keeping the CEO satisfied at the level of the, of the perpetual child. Yeah. Right? Show me how good I am. I need you to go down there and work 25 hours so I can go report how good I am. Those types of things. So long as that's the environment that your corporate world is is operating under, nothing's going to change, no matter what wellness program you introduce. Yeah. The other thing, though, there is a bottom up, and that's the individual. So, for example, most people want to make more money. Yes. When you have more energy and more vitality and more creativity, then you have more capability of doing a better job. Absolutely. And you have the energy to get upskilled. And the next thing you know, you're getting promoted. Yes. And you use the same principles and practice, you get promoted again, and all of a sudden now you're in a position of influence to work top down. Correct. Correct. So Absolutely. You Absolutely. can go bottom up. That's the individual path. Top down yes. is the few controlling the many. Right. But most of the people are at the bottom. So yes. And I would love to share just uh, before we go, I'd love to share this dynamic about what you just talked about. And so if if we're not careful about making sure that how we inf- uh, uh, affect or influence the corporate environment is is holistic. In other yeah. words, don't show up and try to kiss the CEO's ass because you want to get their money. Mm-hmm. Go in there and be real and be like, hey, you're going to be part of this too, right? And here's why I say that because what can likely happen and, and what really does happen is you get these people uh, that that do climb the ladder because they've they've fortified themselves at the individual level. And then they find themselves in a position of leadership, right? 
And because I signed a non-disclosure agreement uh, with a previous employer, I can't go into very specific details about my anecdotal situation. But I can tell you there was a place I worked once where I did get to a position of leadership. And the healthier I got, the more integrated I became, the more I fell out of favor with those people. And the rubber hit the road when there was a dangerous chemical that was, uh, it's a chemical that uh, there's laws written around it and what you're supposed to do. And through the course of the pain teacher, I realized that the company I was working for was operating illegally. They'd never gotten permits. They'd never gotten testing. In other words, they didn't know the level of, of jeopardy that we were under by being exposed to this chemical. And the message from the corporate office was, just pretend like everything's fine. Mm -hmm. Until when? Until we get this tested out and find out how dangerous it is. Oh, mm -hmm. is that the right thing to do? Or is that the obligation to the shareholders? Well, we know the answer to that, Yeah. right? Now, do I think this person giving the advice was evil? Maybe, I don't know. But let's assume they're not. What's the other option? They're not very integrated. They're not very individuated. They don't know why they're doing what they're doing. So if we don't fix it from the top down and the bottom up, eventually there's going to be a clash. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really my mission with this. And it, a big part of that, obviously, is my personal story. But I see the opportunity. And it does, it's just like taking someone who never drinks water and say, why don't you try drinking a liter of water a day? Yeah. That's the kind of impact we can make right away. Yeah. Yeah, it's important to do. And it's important to stand up for yourself because if you keep playing the corporate game and eating junk and the whole thing and doing things you don't want to do and staying up late and, you know, it's just a, it, you know, it's, it's rot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, God's going to keep testing you. It's rot. Yeah. And yeah. rot consumes. Consumes. And you can, the universe will test you. And I was sitting there going, holy crap, is this really the answer? She's like, well, what are your values? Mm -hmm. What do you say? What do you tell everybody your values are? What do you tell yourself your values are? Mm -hmm. And if you don't do this, what's this precedent going to be setting? Yeah. I just want to leave people with that. Your values are always your values. And whether you're in a corporate environment, whether you're in your living environment, as soon as you get in touch with what those are, you will always be given an opportunity mm -hmm. to prove that that's what you're being run by. Like attracts like and opposites attract. So you'll always attract people like you to yourself and you'll always have to confront the opposites in yourself <laughs> and in the relationship. So, yeah. well, good. That, that, you know, we, we covered a lot of ground. We talked about the issues of the world, the issues of life for all of us. We also talked about the, the real simple things all of us can do. And the first thing I think we all have to do is just stop bullshitting ourselves. I mean, that's yes, sir. in my series on YouTube called The Fastest Way to Health, which any of you can watch for free. The first thing I say is you'll never get healthy if you don't stop bullshitting yourself. That's right. And I think right. we all just need to stop bullshitting ourselves. Uh, our bodies never lie. Our emotions are telling us the truth. And our conscience is a, a fairly reliable guide until our soul comes online. And so the, the truth of the matter is we all have a similar archetypal structure to our lives and our mind. We're all doing, you know, we're all, what is a culture? It's a bunch of people doing the same things. Mm -hmm. yeah. and that's what a culture is. And so we can see whether or not We've been enculturated into an environment that supports health and freedom and vitality and creativity or not. And if we wait for the culture to change, we'll die first. But if we change it ourselves, we've changed the culture. That's right. And don't, so, don't wait for anything to happen for you decide to show up yeah, for life. Yeah. As Ken Wilber says, wake up, clean up, grow up, and show up. That's right. All right. Well, thanks to all of you for joining me and Jerry. And... uh you got Jerry's info. It'll be in the show notes as well. He's got a lot of experience. He's helped a hell of a lot of people. And there's also Czech professionals all over the world. And if you go to the Czech Institute, uh, there's a locator system at the bottom of the home page. If you scroll all the way to the down, to the bottom. And uh, one of the things that's very helpful for all of you is all the things that my sponsors offer are excellent for your health or I would not be offering them to you on the podcast. And there's very, very helpful and simple things that each of them. So check out their websites. And so thank you to all the sponsors for all your love and support. And thanks to all of you guys. Hey, we're each a spoke in the wheel. That's right. We, we got to do our one thirty second <laughs> and hold the wheel of life up. 
And uh, I really appreciate all you guys joining me and Jerry today. And I look forward to sharing something exciting and interesting with you next Tuesday. Lots of love. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Jerry Kaikendal. Jerry is offering Paul's podcast listeners 20% off his coaching services and workshops through 2024. And if you are a Czech Academy student, you can get a 50% discount off his coaching and mentorship services. Go to biohackingtruth.com and use the code PAUL20. That's biohackingtruth.com and use the code PAUL20. Check out Jerry's podcast, Sovereign Mind, Body and Soul on Spotify or Substack. Go to linkfly.to forward slash Coach Jerry to subscribe, book a call with Jerry, or download some of his free resources. That's linkfly.to forward slash Coach Jerry. You can catch up with Paul on Instagram, TikTok, and threads at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. This podcast would not be possible without the support of our premier sponsors by Optimizers, Organifi, and Paleo Valley, our podcast sponsors, Ned and Wild Pastures, and our preferred podcast sponsor, Peak Life. Please show your appreciation by taking advantage of their special discounts for listeners, and you can find the links in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review on the podcast platform of your choice. This podcast is available on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcast, and YouTube.